Hi everyone, I hope everyone's well. Today, I'll be answering question 33, the astrophysics section of the 2017 um, HSC physics paper. I've answered this in a separate document, so you don't have to watch me writing everything, but all the questions are exactly the same. Okay, part A, part one asks, why do space-based optical telescopes provide more information than similar sized Earth-based optical telescopes. So they're both optical telescopes, it's just that one is in space and one is on Earth. Space-based optical telescopes reside outside the atmosphere so none of the incoming light can be absorbed or distorted by the atmosphere. So that's a two mark question. We talked about that they're outside the atmosphere and the key parts there are light is not absorbed or distorted by the atmosphere. The twinkling of stars that we see when we look up into the night sky is caused by the distortion um, of, of incoming light by the atmosphere. So that's the distortion effect. Similarly, light, some frequencies of visible light are also absorbed to different amounts uh, by the atmosphere. So we actually don't see a completely accurate color spectrum of the stars that we observe on Earth as well. So. When we have our telescopes outside in space, they are two things that we avoid. Okay. Part two asks, P and Q, two stars, P and Q, have apparent magnitudes of 10.3 and 8.5. Use the brightness ratio to compare the brightness of the, to these two stars. That's a three mark question. So I've written here, the apparent magnitude is how an object appears from Earth using the magnitude scale. So you don't have to include that in your answer. I just put that there so people would know what I'm talking about in case they weren't sure. Because there is a fair bit of assumed knowledge in these questions. I won't go into too much depth with them though. I'll just talk about how to answer the question. So we need to use the brightness ratio to compare the brightness of these two stars. Now that equation looks like this. If I have, if I want to compare the brightness of two stars, A and B, it would look like this, IA divided by IB, and that's the intensity of the two, equals 100 to the power of MB minus MA divided by five. That, that's the equation I need to use, where the little, where MB and MA are the apparent magnitudes of the stars. The reason the equation look like, looks like this is because it's the division of two logarithmic values. So we're working with that. Now, we've got two, we've got two values here, we've, but we're interested in the stars I, Q, and P. So we're gonna be interested in the ratio of IQ to IP. So that's the, gonna be the subject of our equation. And we so we need to know the magnitudes or the apparent magnitudes of each of those. So MP equals 10.3 and MQ equals 8.5. Now if I sub this into my equation, I can say that IQ over IP equals 100 to the power of 10.3 minus 8.5, yep, divided by five. And if I plug that into my plug that into my calculator, I see that's 100 to the power of 0 0.36, which equals 5.25, if you plug that into the calculator as well. So I do that, and I see that IQ, so, well this is saying IQ, over IP equals 5.25. And now if I multiply both sides by IP, I get IQ equals IP 5.25. I should say, oh, that's the wrong way around. I don't know why I said that. Equals 5.25 IP. So IQ, we can say, is 5.25 times greater than IP. Or 2.5 times as bright as IP. That's what we can say. Cool.
till we figured out how bright IQ is compared to IP. And that's the answer part two. Part B, part one says, the diagram shows the positions of stars X and Y on the HR diagram. So HR diagram is a Hertzsprung Russell diagram. And they're the guys who develop this diagram where we place all the stars based on their spectral type, their luminosity, and their absolute magnitude. Now, we've got two stars, X and Y, and we can see that they are along the main sequence line, which is this line that goes along here. Now, outline the differences in the spectra of stars X and Y. So that's all we have to do. We just have to outline the differences of the spectra and stars X and Y. And we see it's a two mark question. So there's not much to it. It can be pretty brief about it. So I've summarized the data here. So star X, we can see that it's in line with spectral class B, or just in, just in line with spectral class B. It's a little bit um, towards O. But. So we see it's spectral class B. And then we can immediately check its data based on that. It is spectral class B, which means its surface temperature is between 10,000 and 30,000 Kelvin. It will be a blue light, blue white color. It will have some medium strength hydrogen lines and it will have neutral helium lines. So that's just for star X. For star Y, we, it's spectral class M, and it's in line with M. And for surface temp, is between 2500 and 3700 Kelvin. It's an orange red color. It has very weak hydrogen lines. It has strong molecular lines, which are titanium oxide, strongest in titanium oxide, and it has strong neutral metals. Now, I've written a little thing underneath here, but however, this is enough to answer that question. Just that, just those dot points there are enough to answer that question. But here's a bit of extra information for those who aren't too aware of how I arrived at my answer, or how we get to this other stuff about the medium strength hydrogen lines and the neutral helium lines. <laughs> so, the lower the energy of the temperature, the lower the energy of the star, I've written this oddly, the lower the energy or the temperature of the star, the lower the energy of the molecules at the surface. At low temperatures, molecules can exist near the surface. However, however as the temperature rises and the star gets a bit hotter, at high temperatures, the molecules are no longer stable, and they break up, and, they, and the main spectral lines come from neutral atoms. So there's no longer molecules, we're just into individual atoms. And as we get even to even higher temperatures, those atoms become ionized, so they're no longer neutral. That's what's happening there. So star X is much hotter than star Y, and as a result, we see these medium strength hydrogen lines and neutral helium lines compared to the molecular lines for star M. Or for star Y, sorry. Okay, so that's question B, part one. Part two. Describe a process which can be used to obtain the spectrum of an individual star. So, the spectrum of a, of a star can be obtained by taking the light from a star and splitting it up into its components. This is done by placing a diffraction grating or prism and placing it over the lens of a telescope. This reveals the spectra of each star in the telescope's field of view. There should be a comma there. So I think that outlines it pretty, ex pretty explicitly. So you just have something such as a diffraction grating or prism which can break up the light into its individual components and you just whack that in front of the lens for a telescope and that's all you need to do. And, that's and that will take the spectra that you can of the stars that you're observing or in the telescope's field of view and it will break that up to make it visible. Cool. So that's part two. So it's a three mark question, but it's still just a described question. So it's not too detailed. It's not too much going on there. Okay. Question C, question C, sorry. A star has a negative color index. Explain how the color index is determined and how it can be used to deduce information about this star. So this is an explain question and it's four marks. So here's, first of all, we're going to start with an explanation of what the color index is. So. It is the difference between its photographic magnitude, B, and its visual magnitude, V. When I say it, it means a star. These magnitudes are the apparent magnitude of the star through a specific lens. And the equation for the color index is equal to B minus V. So that's a pretty important equation. And I would write that in your answer. 
do you have to write this table that's here now? I don't think so. I just included that as a bit of extra information for you guys. So we have three different lenses. We have a U lens, a B lens, and a V lens. And what that does is it filters out in certain types of light. So the U lens lets most up, lets ultraviolet light through. The B lens lets blue light through, and the visual lens lets yellow green light through. It's center wavelengths, well, it's the center wavelength, so the main wavelength that gets through. And it's based upon, so the B and V lenses are based upon photographic magnitude and visual magnitude. And this is based on some historic, or well, based on the old ways, basically, of looking at stars. When we look at stars with our, with our with the naked eye, our eyes are most um, attuned to seeing yellow-green light. So stars that are yellow, a yellowy-greeny sort of colour, maybe even red, uh, appear brighter to us than blue stars. Anyway. Oh, and also, if you have use a photographic film, or the right type of photographic film, a blue star will appear brighter than a red star, even though that might not be the case. It's just how they appear because of the um, visual stuff going on. So what we have, what people developed, or what scientists developed, is this colour index, which takes the magnitudes of the B and the V, and we take the difference between them to numeri have a numerical value for a star's brightness based on its brightness through different lenses. So a red star is brighter through a V filter than a B. So its V magnitude will be lower than its B magnitude. And that's because it uses a logarithmic scale and brighter values or brighter stars have a smaller value. So if its V magnitude will be lower than its B magnitude, the difference between B and V will be positive. If a star has a negative colour index, then it will be blue, because its B magnitude will be less than its V. A blue star will be a spectral class O or B, and its temperature will be somewhere between 50,000 Kelvin and 10,000 Kelvin. Okay guys, I might wrap the video up there. So that was part C of question 33, the astrophysics section. If you liked that video, please give it a thumbs up. If you dis disliked it, give it a thumbs down. And please um, share and subscribe if you found this content useful. Okay, guys, thanks for listening.